Good day everyone, Rune here. And this is chapter 8 of my What If Ash Met Me Out First series. In the last chapter, Ash and Misty worked together to defeat Sabrina in a double battle while showing her the fun of Pokemon battles. After this victory, Ash decided to bring his magic cup onto the team, resulting in him and Misty gaining the nickname Fishy Friends. Brock gains a new Pokemon in the form of Mankey, and the group arrives in Celadon where Ash and Misty challenge the gym. However, while Misty gains her rainbow badge, Team Rocket set the gym on fire before Ash can attempt for his. With the gym now gutted by the fire, Ash decides to continue his journey and come back to earn the badge when they fix the gym up. This is where the next chapter begins. Sometime after the events of Hop 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 Town, the group find themselves on Scissor Street where Brock is looking for a particular store. When Misty stops to admire a poster of a coughing and Eggins in rather... Unique fashion, Ash comments about how it doesn't look practical, questioning how Pokemon would be able to move with all that fabric. He's tactfully keeping his opinions on how gaudy it looks to himself. When Brock finally finds the place that he's looking for, the group meets Susie, who's busy massaging a Chansey. When Missy tries to pick up Susie's Vulpix, Ash quickly stops her, saying that you should never pick up a Pokemon that's sleeping. How would you feel if someone woke up you from a nice nap? Says the kid that can barely drag himself out of bed in the morning. Susie also pipes in, saying that Volpix doesn't like being picked up by strangers. Brock then asks to be Susie's pupil, and everyone sits down for some tea. And things go about the same until the topic of the outside or inside being more important comes up. Here, Ash and Misty don't get into an argument, as Ash has a lot more tact and is better able to convey his opinion without sounding rude about it. Here, Ash says that fashion comes and goes, and it never remains consistent. But the Pokemon, or person, on the inside is what always remains, and what will have a lasting impact. Misty expresses surprise that Ash being able to say something so profound. I'll... take that as a compliment? Misty says that she still wants to check out Salon Roquet out of curiosity, and Ash suggests that she take Squirtle with her and make a day out of it. Things continue similar to canon, with Misty finding out that Team Rocket are running the salon due to Porygon being there at all, as it is a very rare Pokemon. When Squirtle arrives at the salon to get help for Misty, Brock and Ash run to save her. Seeing Misty's face, no one laughs, but Ash does say that that is way too much makeup. This time, it's Jesse and James that have a monologue about their plan ends with Sir Lon Roquet, earning each of them a Giga Impact from Porygon, who's irate at them for revealing their plans to the entire street. Things continue without any noticeable changes, and Brock, like in canon, gets Vulpix. Ash also helps Misty get the makeup off her face, saying that she doesn't need all that gunk as she's already awesome enough. Later, as the team is walking down the road, they come across a head Chan, which really confuses Ash as they aren't usually found in the area. They soon witness the confrontation between Rebecca and her father Anthony. When she asks them to defeat her father so that he'll come home, Brock is the only one that can take up the request. Since, remember, Ash doesn't have a fighting or rock type Pokemon. Brock was the one that got Mankey. Here, since Mankey and Brock already have a good relationship, Brock doesn't need to worry about Mankey not listening to him. After the first battle with Machop, Mankey even evolves into Primeape. The tournament continues until Anthony and Hitmonchan are facing Team Rocket and Hitmonlee. Just like Meowth and Cannon, Porygon uses glue to help their side cheat. Rebecca jumps in the way of the attack to protect Hitmonchan, and Anthony shields her from the attack before surrendering. Ash muses to Misty that seeing Rebecca in danger must have reminded him of what was truly important. When Hitmonchan gets out of the ring, Meowth spots a bit of glue stuck to its foot and points it out to the others. It is here that Team Rocket reveals themselves. While Misty thinks that they should report Team Rocket's cheating so they can be disqualified, Brock says that Primeape wants to defeat them in the ring. While Primeape and Hitmonlee battle, Ash, Pikachu, and Meowth overhear Team Rocket talking about a booby trap they'd set up under the stage. Thinking fast, the three work together to disable the bomb and remove it from the ring, allowing Primeape to win without any interference. Then, crawling out from under the stage, Ash gives the bomb back to Jesse and James with an, I think this is yours. The bomb then blows up, sending Team Rocket flying. 
Anthony then, like in canon, offers to train Primeape. Brock accepts the offer, saying that he's more of a breeder than a trainer, and he can tell that Primeape is definitely a battler, so he knows that it would be happier with Anthony. After some more travel, the group find themselves in Grinchy City, where they all take note of how polluted it is. Meowth tells Ash that Pikachu isn't looking so good and they all rush to the center. There, they find the irritable and nonchalant Nurse Joy who brushes off Pikachu's condition as a cold, much to Ash's irritation. Before he can start giving the seemingly cold nurse a piece of his mind, the power goes out. Rushing to the intensive care unit, Nurse Joy explains the Pokémon's conditions. Worrying over the Pokémon and remembering Meowth's talent with mechanics, Ash tells Meowth to stay at the center and try to rig up some kind of backup power source while he, Misty, and Brock try to find out what's happened. When they are at the police station, they are shocked to discover that Pikachu had followed them. Misty suggests that Pikachu had been worried about Ash being on his own without Pikachu or Meowth to keep an eye on him. When they reach the power plant, they are stunned at the fact that no one is around. When Misty gets spooked by something flying around in the hall, Ash tells her not to worry. He remembers reading something about Pokemon and power plants, though he can't quite remember what, so it was probably just a wild Pokemon that came into the plant because it got spooked by the power outage. When the mysterious figure is revealed to be a Magnemite, everyone relaxes. Misty suggests that the Magnemite might have caused the power outage, but Ash dismisses it as a single Magnemite wouldn't have been able to cause that amount of damage. They also note that it seems to be following Pikachu, and Ash wonders if it's because of Pikachu's high electricity. Just as they're about to continue down the hall, a foul smell hits them, and Ash suddenly remembers what it was he'd read. It was about how Grimer and Muck were often seen around power plant sites, and that it was theorized that the high levels of pollution around these sites were what attracted these Pokemon to them. Back with Meowth, he's finally managed to rig up a makeshift generator using a boiler and wood to turn the lights back on in the ICU. He nervously tells Joy that he doesn't think that it'll last the whole night though. His thoughts then turn to the others and he looks out the nearby window which has a hazy view of the power plant. He silently tells them to hurry and come back safe. Back over with Ash and Co, their encounter with the Grimer and Muck is going about the same as in Cadden right up to and including Ash catching the muck. Misty asks why Ash would catch it since he already has Oddish as a poison type, to which Ash explains that he wants to find it a new home where it won't accidentally hurt anyone. He also muses that he's probably going to need to give Oak a call to warn him about what's getting sent to him and if he's already opened the ball, apologize. Returning to the center, Ash, Meowth and Pikachu have a happy reunion. Nurse Joy and Officer Jenny explain that they're going to be getting the center a proper backup generator in case something happens again. They're also going to be trying to clean up the area to try and deter Grimer and Muck from coming back. Ash suggests that they send a job request to Gala asking for any trainers with Galarian Weezing to come and help. At everyone's confusion, Ash pulls out his one and only Gala Dex card revealing a Galarian Weezing. Taking the card, Jenny reads the description of the Pokemon out loud, revealing that it's a Pokemon that eats pollution in the air, and that it's believed that it had evolved into this form in order to combat Gala's own pollution problem. The group continues their journey and soon, once again, becomes lost. This realization causes Ash to sigh, lamenting how not one of them has any sense of direction. They are just about to start looking for any kind of landmark when their attention is drawn to a loud explosion. Running to the sound's direction, they soon come across a building site for a dam where they soon witness a multi-truck pile-up caused by a bunch of Diglett. Rushing down to the trucks to see if anyone's hurt, the friends soon bear witness to the dam foreman's rant about the Diglett. Hearing about how the Diglett have been hindering the construction, Ash's mind instantly jumps to one of their recent adventures. 50 bucks says that this is another Nestina situation. Before Misty can even giggle at Ash's comment, Gary rolls up in his convertible, spouting his ego-driven speech about how he'll get rid of the Diglett. As he turns to Ash to rub his face in how much better Gary is at battling, his thunder is immediately lost as he sees Ash walking away with Meowth and Pikachu, not even paying attention to what Gary is saying. 
Shocked and more than a little annoyed at being ignored, Gary shouts after Ash, asking where he's going. Ash looks over his shoulder and says that he's going to talk to the Diglett. Gary laughs at Ash's statement, asking how Ash intends to talk to the Diglett. Just say, Dig, Dig, Diglett. To which Ash fully turns to him and points at Meath on his shoulder, asking if Gary had seriously forgotten that he travels with a Pokemon translator. While Gary is silent with embarrassment, Ash continues his explanation, saying that there are two sides to every conflict. They've heard the Foreman's, now it's time to get the Diglett's side. As Ash is walking off, Gary mutters that Ash has always been a weirdo. Cut to later, and we see Ash and his friends standing amongst the group of trainers that had all come to partake in the Diglett hunt. Ash is standing next to Misty and Brock, looking very annoyed at being forced to listen to this when he would much rather be looking for the Diglett. Misty tries to placate Ash by saying that this will let them know what the trainers are planning so that Ash doesn't get accidentally hurt while he's searching for the Diglett. When Gary shows off his knowledge of the Diglett, Ash is forced to stifle a laugh as he whispers to Misty a, like grandfather, like grandson comment. When the Diglett show up, Gary is just about to throw a Pokeball when Ash crouches down next to the Diglett with Meow. Gary tells Ash to get away from the Diglett if he doesn't want to get hurt while throwing out his first Pokemon, only for it to not come out. Ash turns to face the still closed Pokeball, wondering why the Pokemon wasn't coming out. Was something preventing it? When Gary throws his second ball to be met with the same results, Ash starts getting a bad feeling. As Gary is about to throw all of his Pokeballs, Ash stops him, saying that there's obviously a reason they're not coming out. When the foreman tries to take matters into his own hands and play whack-a-mole with the Diglett, Ash and Gary find themselves sighing in unison. Ash says that the Diglett are the least of their problems now, pointing out that if something is preventing the Pokemon from coming out, that's a much bigger issue. Gary reluctantly agrees, only for Meath to tell them that Ash's theory is not quite right. He then leads the group, plus Gary and the foreman, to a grove where Diglett and Doug Trio are seen planting trees. Looking at the Pokemon planting young trees to replace the old ones, Ash realises that this really is another Nestina situation. When Gary asks what Ash is talking about, Ash briefly explains the events of Tentacool and Tentacruel before pointing at the incomplete dam, which is still visible from where they are. Gary catches on quickly, realising that if the dam was completed, the entire forest would be flooded, destroying not only the Diglett and Doug Trio's home, but the homes of all the Pokemon living in the forest. Meowth chips in, explaining that the trainer's Pokemon had been refusing to come out because they had realised what the Diglett were doing. The foreman agrees to stop the construction of the dam, unwilling to hurt so many Pokemon. Just as it seems everything is coming to a close, Team Rocket crashes the happy mood, once again planning to Pokenap Meowth and Pikachu. Ash, in exasperation, asks if they don't have anything better to do than follow him and his friends around. Confused, Gary asks Ash who Team Rocket is and why Ash really doesn't seem happy to see them. You want the long or the short version? Short? First day as a trainer, they attacked the Viridian Pokemon Center while Misty and I were there. We fought them off, and ever since, they've been trying to Pokenap both Meowth and Pikachu. Gary splutters at this explanation, asking how Ash managed to get put on the radar of people like that on his first day. Ash says that he's been asking himself that very same question. Fed up with being ignored, Team Rocket attacks Ash and Co with their newly evolved Arbok and Weezing. Despite their rivalry and constant headbutting, Gary doesn't hesitate to jump in to help Ash defend his Pokemon. After Team Rocket has been blasted away, Gary asks Ash how often he has to deal with them, to which Ash answers, about once a week. He tells Gary not to worry though, as they're more annoying than anything else. Most of the time. Browning, Gary seems to contemplate something for a few minutes before reaching into his bag and pulling out what looks like a watch. Handing it to Ash, Gary explains that it's an X Transceiver, a new product from Unova which acts as a portable video phone. He tells Ash to call him if he ever finds himself tangled up with people worse than Jesse James and Porygon. Ash thanks Gary, surprised at the gesture. Gary tells him that just because Ash is a royal pain in his neck doesn't mean he wants him getting kidnapped by crooks. Besides, he really doesn't want to be the one to explain something like that to his grandfather or Ash's mom. Stifling a laugh, Ash secures the X-Transceiver to his wrist. 
And that, everyone, is where I'm going to leave the story for now. Join me next time as we see Ash and Misty take on the Fuchsia City Gym. I'm Rune, see you next chapter.